So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Lawrence Perot Lavasseur. And Lawrence is the Canada Research Chair in Computational Cosmology and in Artificial Intelligence. She is an assistant professor at the University of Montreal and an associate member of MILA, where she does research in the development and application of machine learning methods to cosmology. She's also a visiting scholar at the Flat Iron Institute in New York City. And before that, she was a Flat Iron Research Fellow at the Center for Computational Astrophysics in the Flat Iron Institute and the Kipak Postdoctoral Fellow at Stanford University. Lawrence completed her PhD degree at the University of Cambridge, where she worked on applications of open effective field theory methods to the formalism of inflation. And today she will talk about data-driven strong gravitational lensing analysis in the era of large sky surveys. And Lawrence, I'll please take it from here. All right. Thanks so much for the nice introduction and for uh, the invitation. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, like the title of my talk says, uh, I'm going to be talking about strong gravitational lensing. But uh, before I get into the details of that, uh, I figured I'd give sort of a brief introduction to where we are currently in cosmology, since I was told that there's sort of a broad background uh, of expertise in the audience. So um, let me get started by showing sort of the must have first slide for a cosmology talk. Uh, so what this picture is showing here is really a representation of our current understanding of the whole history of the universe from its birth all the way up to today. So here time goes from uh, left to right. And uh, what the image is showing is that everything that we know around us today in the universe emerged from quantum fluctuations about 4 billion years ago. So during uh, this period of inflation, those fluctuations, those quantum fluctuations got stretched with space time to cosmic scales. And then um, as the universe started to cool down after inflation more slowly with the regular expansion of space, uh, um, so that sort of th those fluctuations sort of cooled down up until the point where there was a phase transition in the content of the universe, where the universe went, the content of the universe went from a phase of plasma to gas, and then all of a sudden the universe became uh, transparent. And then the photons that uh, were emitted at that point are, are, that's called the cosmic microwave background or CMB for short. And so those photons got emitted at that point. And then they basically stayed practically untouched throughout the whole evolution of the universe as stars and galaxies were forming all the way uh, up to today where they reach us and uh, we can observe them. So, um, by looking at those photons and by looking at the light that comes from all those structures like galaxies and clusters and other large scale structures, we can learn about the content of our universe and its evolution. So from those CMB photons, uh, we can learn that the universe started out in this initial period of inflation. And then from the way that structure formed from there and from the dynamics of galaxies and clusters, we can infer the presence of what we call dark matter. And then finally, from looking at the more recent evolution of the universe at redshifts less than like 2.5, we can infer the presence of dark energy that uh, causes the beginning of a new period of accelerated expansion. So um, if we put all those ingredients together, uh, we get what we call the standard model of cosmology or the inflationary lambda CDM model for short, which tells us that uh, the initial conditions of the universe are given in an initial period of inflation. And then today, the energy content of the universe is made up of 70% dark energy, 25% dark matter, and just 5% regular matter. That's like the stuff that like you and I are made up of and like the stars and the dust and everything that we can see basically uh, in the universe. So this model is a really good explanation. Like it's really good at explaining almost every single observation that we've made of our universe at a really wide range of different scales, both in space and in time. So at this point, we could ask, well, are we done with cosmology? And uh, the answer is obviously no, because uh, we don't understand any of the main components of this model at all. So for inflation, uh, we don't understand the nature of the field that's uh, at the origin uh, that's causing inflation. Uh, for dark matter, uh, we only know that it gravitates and we have never managed to measure any of its other properties. And then for dark energy, we don't have the slightest idea of, of what it could be. 
So um, in order to go beyond this very unsatisfactory current understanding of the universe, there's a new generation of sky surveys that are going to enter online in the next decade that are gonna produce an unprecedented, an unprecedented sorry, amount of data. And, and one of their primary goal is really going to be to shed light on those three uh, fundamental questions about the nature of the main components of our standard model of cosmology. So um, in the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to be talking, focusing mostly on the question of what is dark matter uh, and how uh, machine learning methods can allow us to uh, answer those questions. And uh, I'm going to answer that specifically under the light of a very specific probe, which is uh, gravitational lensing. So uh, in gravitational lensing, what happens is that the image of some distant background galaxy is distorted by the presence of some foreground massive structure along the line of sight. So in weak gravitational lensing, that's what I'm showing here, the background galaxies are sort of sheared and distorted, uh, for example, by a cluster, and, uh, and then it deforms the background uh, galaxies. So this has been used to map out the distribution of dark matter on very large scale, like cluster scales. Um, so on those scales, we have managed to get really good constraints on the dark matter distribution, and it's consistent with our simplest model of dark matter that's called cold dark matter. But if we want to measure some new properties of dark matter, we have to explore some like different smaller scales, basically. So one of the main things with dark matter is that its clustering properties are hugely affected by its particle properties on small scales. So there's a lot of information that we can gain on the specific model of dark matter by probing those small uh, scales. And, and that's where basically another different kind of lensing comes in that's called strong gravitational lensing. So in strong gravitational lensing, there's the formation of multiple images of a single distant object due to the deflection of its light rays by the gravity of some intervening structure. So let's say that here we're on the, we're on the Earth and there's two galaxies, one right behind the other one. So as the light rays of the background galaxy pass near the foreground galaxy, they get bent and so they come to us from different angles. And so as a result, here on the Earth, we see multiple images of the same background galaxy. So it's a little bit like looking at a fish on the corner of a fish tank. Uh, if you've ever noticed, you can see multiple images of the same fish. Um, so here's uh, Mr. Mango demonstrating this effect. So as he gets to the corner of the fish tank, you can see two images uh, of the same fish. And it makes an image that's very similar to actual images of strong lenses that we see in the sky. So here we see two images of the same background quasar because of the deflection of its light rays by uh, the gravity of the lensing galaxy that's in orange. So of course, in this case, um, the bending of light is due to the gravity of the lens and galaxy as opposed to refraction in the glass, like in the case of, of the fish tank. So here's another example of a strong gravitational lens. Um, here, everything that we see is a galaxy, but then uh, there's this blue galaxy, uh, and then its light sort of forms arcs and wraps around the, the lens and galaxy that's in orange. So this feature of like producing arcs is very common in strong lensing, and that's because of the geometry of the lens. So you can reproduce an effect that's very similar at home with a wine glass and a candle. So um, let's say that you have a candle and you look at the flame of the candle through the foot of a wine glass like this. You see that the um, flame of the candle starts to wrap around the foot of the wine glass and it produces an image that is really similar to images of strong lenses that we see in the sky. So in this analogy, the flame of the candle is the background galaxy whose image is getting distorted and the foot of the wine glass is the foreground lensing galaxy that's causing uh, the distortions. So um, just to go back to this, the, the, the of the power second of dark matter, uh, what we want to do is to use this effect to probe the small scale structure of dark matter. So um, we basically want to map out how dark matter is distributed on small subgalactic scales, so inside lensing galaxies. So the way that it works is a little bit like looking at clouds. So some are very smooth and some are very clumpy. And then by measuring how clumpy they are, we can learn something about their temperature. So we want to do something similar with dark matter. We want to measure how clumpy it is inside galaxies and then learn about its particle properties, like its temperature. So how do we do that? So uh, if we go back to the wine glass analogy, if we imagine that on top of the foot of the wine glass, there's a bunch of water droplets, those water droplets are going to cause an additional layer of distortion. And then through that, we can infer their presence. 
So basically by measuring how smooth the structure of the foot of the wine glass is by looking at those extra levels of distortion, we can um, measure the dark matter distribution on subgalactic scales. And then we can use that um, to measure the temperature of dark matter. So this is one example of an application of what we can do with strong lensing lensing. So that's what I'm most interested in, but there's a lot of other sciences that we can do with strong lensing. We can also use it to study uh, the background source, so like the flame of the candle, and that's because lensing magnifies uh, images. So we can use it as uh, basically a natural telescope to study very distant galaxies that would otherwise be below our sensitivity or resolution limits. Uh, we can also use it to do cosmology uh, by measuring uh, cosmological parameters like H0, and I'm gonna come back to that uh, in just a little bit. But then whatever the science is that we wanna do with strong lensing, we need to figure out how to analyze the data. So let's say that I have uh, some image of a strong lens. In order to do any sort of science with it, I need to be able to do two things simultaneously. So first, I need to be able to reconstruct the undistorted image of the background galaxy, that's the flame of the candle. And then second, I need to be able to map out how mass is distributed in the lensing galaxy, so in the foot of the wine glass. So formally, this has the structure of an inverse problem that can be written like this. So here, y is a vector of noisy data. Um, x is a vector of linear parameters. So these are the pixel values of the undistorted image of the background source. So those parameters are linear. And then uh, they get multiplied by basically a lensing matrix that encodes a distortion. And uh, in that lensing matrix, there is a set of nonlinear parameters, the lensing parameters that describe how mass is distributed in the lensing galaxy. So these are nonlinear parameters. And then N is basically a vector of additive noise. So, um, all right. So traditionally, basically, um, this is modeled with uh, maxima posterior methods. And, and so the posterior will be sampled with an MCMC. And because it's nonlinear in the lensing parameters, it's extremely multimodal in a way that makes it incredibly difficult to sample. So um, what that means is that uh, lens modeling used to be extremely lengthy and extremely expensive. Uh, but until recently, it was not such a big deal because we knew only of a few hundred strong lenses altogether. So the analysis of those lenses used to take like a couple of days to a couple of weeks, to even sometimes like a year for an individual lens. But now with surveys like LSST and Euclid and the Roman Space Telescope, we're expecting to discover more than 170,000 new strong attention lenses. But this is super exciting because it's going to give us a lot of statistical power to do all of the exciting science we want to do with strong lensing. But then at the same time, how are we going to analyze 170,000 lenses? So if we assume that it takes about like three days to do the simplest possible uh, model of a single strong lens, it would take 1,400 years to finish the analysis of all of the LSST sample. And that's like the time of a person, if the person doesn't eat or sleep for like five weekends, so it's, it's extremely lengthy. So clearly we need new analysis methods. So um, a couple of years ago, we showed that there was a very easy, simple solution to this problem. We can just train a simple vanilla CNN to predict the parameters that describe how mass is, is distributed in the lensing galaxy, so the set of nonlinear parameters. So what I'm showing here is that is the prediction of the CNN on the y-axis versus the ground return on the x-axis, and then we see that the CNN manages to do a very reasonable good job. Um, but the main point here is that this is 10 million times faster than traditional lens modeling methods. So instead of taking 1,400 years, to finish the analysis of all of the LSST lenses, it would take half an hour on, on the laptop. So this is uh, this looks like very promising. So since then, we've been doing a lot of different works on different aspects of the strong lensing problem. So another thing that we've looked at is how to do the background source image uh, reconstruction. So uh, to look at that in more details, uh, let's just look at how this is done with traditional methods first. So if we parameterize the background source by a pixelated image, so every pixel is a free parameter, uh, then this is, like I said, a linear inverse problem. Um, so to get the distorted image, we just need to multiply the source by a matrix, basically. So because it is a linear problem, we can write down the solution analytically, where like CN uh, inverse is the inverse covariance matrix of, of the noise. So of course, this is a heavily under-constrained problem, because let's say that I have 100 by 100 pixels in my image, and this is a 10,000 dimensional parameter space. And so obviously I need to introduce something to regularize this inverse problem. And so I need to write on the prior, uh, but then to keep the problem tractable analytically, I need to keep it 
you know, analytical. And so the only thing I can do is to use a Gaussian prior. So if I add that, uh, this is where the covariance matrix of my prior comes in. And then I get, you know, the usual solution for a uh, linear inverse problem. So let's see how well this does in the reconstruction. So you can see that it does an okay job, but it's not perfect. There's a lot of noise that leaks through the reconstruction. So the question we have is like, can we do better with machine learning methods basically? Um, so the specific model that we looked at is something called the recurrent inference machine. Um, so it's a machine learning model that's designed to solve inverse problems that are generic, but like in our specific case, it's a, it's a linear inverse problem. So Y again is a vector of noisy data, X is the vector that contains the parameters that we want to infer, F is the physical model, and then N is the vector of noise, additive noise. So if we assume that the noise is Gaussian, it's really easy to write uh, the likelihood of y given x is just a Gaussian. And then what the RM does, the, the machine learning model, is that it solves the top equation for x recursively uh, by looking at every step of the recursion, the current place where it is in parameter space, and the gradient of the likelihood at that place. So it works in a way that's very similar to gradient descent, except that it has an internal memory state that keeps track of where it's been in, in, in parameter space. So what it ends up doing at the end of the day is acting like a meta learner that learns to optimize a class of likelihoods that it's been trained on, basically. So uh, more specifically, how does this recursion works? So at every step of the recursion, uh, the model outputs its current best reconstruction for what the parameters are. So that's the undistorted image of the background source. We pass that to the physical model in B, we get the model in C, the lens image. We pass that to the likelihood in D, and then we take the derivative with respect to the parameters. So these are the pixel of the image in A. And we pass this to the RM and we get the next output at that and it keeps on going until it converges. So during training, we end up showing it like where it should end up in parameter space so that it should know where to go. And then once it's trained, we can test it on new images and, and this is what we get. So we see like, so on the uh, left, I have like the image at the top, the ground source at the bottom. At the top on the right is the RM reconstruction and at the bottom is the linear inversion that I showed before. So we see that just by eye, it's very obvious that it does a lot better. Uh, so to quantify how much better it does, we can look at the cross correlation or like the coherence spectrum between the reconstruction and the ground truth. And so in blue, it's the RM and in red is the linear inversion. So we see that on every scale, the RM matches to outperform uh, the traditional method. So this is super interesting because up to now we were, at that point, we were mostly interested in machine learning for speeding up the analysis. But this was the first point where we realized that with machine learning method, we could also gain in accuracy of whatever analysis we were doing. And so the reason here why the machine learning model manages to outperform traditional methods is because like I said, with the traditional linear inversion method, we have to write an analytic prior. So we're constrained to using a very simplistic prior, like a two point correlation function basically of the background source. And that's a really poor representation of the knowledge we have of what the galaxy should look like. So the prior is really misspecified basically. And so with the machine learning model on the other hand, it's flex it, it has a lot more flexibility so it can learn implicitly a much more complex prior from its training data. And that's what allows it to outperform uh, the traditional methods. So this is uh, pretty, this looks promising. So another thing that we did is that we looked how well it does uh, for out of distribution examples. So what we did is that we looked at what happens if we put background, like instead of a background galaxy as a background image, we put text. And then so we lens it and it makes like the mock image that is on the uh, left on top. Um, so with the linear inversion method, we get some reconstruction that's like has still has a lot of noise that leaks through. But then the surprising thing is that with the arm, it does not break it. And it still manages to do a lot better than the traditional method, even though we're really far outside of the training data. So that's super interesting to see that those models that have some, they're kind of physics informed because they know about the likelihood. Um, they're a lot more robust to out of distribution examples. Uh, another thing that we can do is test, because uh, every time that we, in the likelihood, we assume that we knew the exact lensing matrix, so the mass distribution in the foot of the wine glass, but in reality, we will never know that. So we can also uh, see how it does for that kind of model misspecification uh, by putting this as the source inversion part of the code in an MCMC that tries to map out the parameters of the lens. So for every proposal, it's going to be slightly the wrong lensing galaxy. And again, we see that it doesn't break the model, which is pretty encouraging. And uh, on top of that, it, still, it manages to get even tighter constraints on the lensing parameters when they use the RM to do the source inversion part. 
Um, so this is uh, pretty cool. Uh, but everything that I've talked about so far is assuming that we have very simple lenses that, so the foot of the wine glass is really simple. It can be parameterized by a handful of parameters. And so uh, that's great, but then reality is a lot more complex than that. Um, so we need to have a much more complex motivation for what's happening in the lensing galaxy. So, uh, so what we could do is we could use a pixelated map uh, to parameterize that. So this is something that my student Alex Adam has been working on during his first year of his PhD. So basically, he's taken galaxies from the TNG simulation and for the lensing galaxies and cosmos galaxies for the background sources. And then he's trained two RMs that work in parallel to do this uh, linear, the full uh, inverse problem. So he has two RMs. The first one works uh, to reconstruct the understarted image of the background source. It's the same that I just talked about. And then the second one reconstructs a pixelated map of the density in the lensing galaxy. And then I say they work together because they share the same forward model to produce a model. And they also share the same likelihood, but they each take the derivative of that likelihood with respect to their own sets of parameters. So uh, this is an example of what it does. And so for the foreground galaxy, because these are non, it's extremely nonlinear. This problem, so it would be extremely difficult to get such good reconstructions with traditional methods. And so these are more example of like more complex math distributions and how well the RM manages to do these reconstructions. And in here, I cannot compare with traditional methods because it's impossible to do this with traditional methods. Like we just cannot do this. Um, so this is extremely promising to do analysis of more realistic data. Uh, but the problem is that these are just point estimates. So what we really want to see, like what an astrophysicist wants to see is really this, it's like samples from the posterior that gives us an idea of what the uncertainties are. Um, so, you know, as it's become more and more clear that like machine learning in general is going to be some integral part of like data analysis pipelines for next year relation of sky surveys in particular for strong lensing, it's it really become obvious that we need to have a way of estimating their errors. Um, so basically, like if we're using neural networks as a statistical model to model data, we really need to have a way to quantify the uncertainties uh, if we're going to be doing like science. So like because of that, there's been a lot of attention given to Bayesian neural networks in the recent years. Uh, they're very appealing because they promise to incorporate like neural networks as a statistical model in a fully Bayesian framework. And so this is really very promising. So the basic idea is that um, you ask a neural network to predict a distribution instead of just a point estimate. And then the weights, instead of having deterministic value, they're sampled from a distribution. So that distribution is learned during training. And then at this time, you basically want to marginalize over it. So in practice, though, there's been a lot of issues with actually implementing those. So from choosing the right prior on the weight to like actually training them. And so practically, the most common way that those are implemented is to use variational inference to learn an approximate distribution over the weights. So for that, like by far, um, the easiest thing to do is to use MC dropout. That's the thing that most people do when they talk about Bayesian neural networks. And so what it does, that it allows you to uh, use some standard like dropout uh, layer to perform variational inference at basically no extra cost. So it's extremely easy to implement. So that's why it's become extremely popular. So here I'm showing some examples of like the one sigma uncertainty intervals you get for some predicted lens parameters uh, versus the ground truth. And then on the right, I'm showing a comparison of uh, the marginal posteriors you get from for this real ALMA data uh, of like the MCMC sample, the estimate from the MCMC uh, in black versus the approximate Bayesian neural network for the same parameter in red. So we see that they're consistent in every case, except that the red posterior is wider because it has the uncertainty that comes from the neural network on top of the statistical uncertainty that just comes from the uncertainty in the data. So this is great in the cases that it works. Uh, the main advantage is, is that um, it's very fast. It's millions of times faster than doing traditional MCMC sampling. So, and then also another advantage is that if it's really critical to get both accurate and precise uncertainties, then we can perform important sampling to get an unbiased distribution. Um, so, but then there's of course some caveats. So one of the main caveats is that in the case of MC dropout, the variational distribution that we're using is extremely simplistic. So um, there are well managed to approximate the true weight distribution could be like very, very bad. And so that can lead to inaccurate uncertainties. So these are, these are two examples, CMB cleaning and our spectroscopy denoising where uh, like these are things that I've tried uh, and it's extremely hard to get uh, good coverage probabilities because the 
variational distribution is just too simplistic to do a good job at approximating the fluid distribution. So, and this is not um, a, a choice that is, uh, so this is not a problem that's unique to MC dropout. It's much more general than that because uh, I don't think that's like with variational inference, there's a way of actually quantifying how well we can approximate the true weight distribution. So basically we get no guarantees that the uncertainties that we have at the end of the day are accurate, which is for a lot of applications where it really matters to have accurate uncertainties, it's really not ideal. Um, so that has uh, motivated us to look into simulation-based inference. Uh, so it's been a couple of years now, but um, so we've basically realized that there's a beautiful way of doing this in a proper Bayesian framework with simulation-based inference. So this is the work of Ronan uh, Ligon, who's a student in our group. Um, so the idea here is that we can just uh, do this with, uh, if I just train a model to produce a point estimator, I can generate a bunch of like latent variables data uh, and then produce simulated images with them. And then I can train a model uh, like a CNN to produce a point estimate of that latent variable that I know by like theta hat. So once my model is trained, I can stop. And now I can draw uh, a bunch of latent variables uh, from my prior distribution, simulate all that data, and predict a bunch of point estimates data hats for, for that, just like I would do for validation of testing. But now um, I get these true variables and the predictions, and then I model their joint distribution. So for a given test set X, which could be a real observation, um, if my model predicts the latent variable to be theta hat X, then uh, the conditional probability P theta given theta hat X is the posterior that I'm looking for. So this is super similar to ABC, um, where we're treating the prediction of the network as the compressed statistics of the data, which is true. Um, so, but uh, for ABC, it's not amortized right here uh, because we use neural density estimators, it's, it's amortized. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of advantages in this case too. Uh, oh yeah, so sorry. So there's a, an example of this uh, applied to some uh, uh, mock data. And so here, uh, this is also the work of Ronan. So he's showing that he's comparing Bayesian neural networks with uh, this SBI framework for strong lensing parameters and trends. And so the bottom line is that as long as we can produce like realistic simulation, the analysis that we do with those neural networks can be even more accurate than with traditional models. Um, so in this framework, we basically get like the best of both worlds. We can use ML to find a compressed statistics and so use all leverage all the power of like very complex machine learning models. Um, but in and then the cool thing is that even if the estimator is biased, we can still get an unbiased estimator. Um, so with only the only drawback basically being that maybe we get like suboptimal precision. Uh, another advantage is that it's fast, and then we can change the prior uh, from data points to the points without having to re retrain the whole uh, data compressor. And then we can also uh, generate samples. That's a very big point, actually. Like we can generate samples that are consistent with our observations. So this is super important to integrate the black box. If we get like a signal, we want to know where does it come from in our data. We can get a bunch of samples that are consistent with the data, so we can interrogate basically where is some prediction coming from. Um, some of the main caveats with this method is that it's really hard to marginalize implicitly over parameters. We need to, uh, to marginalize implicitly. We need to explicitly marginalize over them. So, and then the, another disadvantage is that uh, it only works in, in low dimensional posteriors. So like of order like 10 dimension uh, maximum. And then obviously it requires an accurate simulation plan. Um, so I think I'm gonna skip over hierarchical Bayesian entrance in the interest of time. I'm just gonna uh, give the bottom line that uh, with this framework, we can also uh, do hierarchical Bayesian inference in the case where we have non-trivial selection functions. So let's say in the case of strong lensing, we might not be able to detect all the lenses below some threshold, and that's going to be given by some lens finding neural network. So we can actually use another neural network to model that selection function that could be very non-trivial, and then incorporate that into a hierarchical framework. So instead of having every time uh, to simulate a bunch of, uh, to produce a bunch of simulations to model that selection function, I just have a neural network that learns it. And then I can basically do unbiased hierarchical Bayesian inference of population level uh, parameters. All right. Uh, okay, so now let's say that we're in the case where we have a posterior over like a low dimensional posterior that we want to estimate, but we have a lot of nuisance parameters that we want to marginalize over, then this framework is not going to be ideal. But there exists a lot of different flavors of uh, like racial estimators that we can uh, use. 
Um, so there's a lot of different flavors of that. I'm not going to give a very thorough introduction of, of what these are because I think people know fairly well what this is. But like the bottom line is that they act as a classifier between two different distributions. Uh, the classifier basically learn to uh, differentiate between um, the joint distribution of the parameters and the latent. So the sorry, the latent and the observation and uh, the 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 basically the product of the uh, the the sorry the marginals. Um, so this uh, is very great for marginalities over a lot of uh, nuisance parameters because we get to choose which parameters we want to include in the data that we want to get the posterior for. So the ones that we exclude, they're basically marginalized over through the process of sampling in the training data. Um, so uh, yes, so one uh, specific application of this that we have in strong lensing is for the case of uh, inferring h naught. So the way that strong lensing can be used to infer H0 is that because we have multiple images of the same background source, if there's some time variability in the background source, the light that travels to us travels through different paths. And so this time variability is going to show up as a time delay between the different images. So by measuring this time delay, we can basically have a way of measuring the cosmological distances. And so H0, uh, which is the parameter that defines the expansion of rate the expansion rate of space uh, today. So this is a very interesting parameter to infer because there's currently some controversy in the measurement of Hubble, the Hubble uh, constant that uh, comes from the fact that early universe probes of uh, H0 versus late time universe uh, probes of H0 have very discrepant, discrepant values that they're measuring. And so this could be really due to a systematic effect, but if we don't find any systematic effect, then it could be that this is due to new physics. Um, and so it's really interesting to have an independent uh, probe of these parameters that relies on different systematics to maybe help with uh, um, uh, selling this debate. And so uh, this is in context that my student, Ev, she's trained a neural ratio estimator to estimate uh, the value of H0. So um, here, um, what she's done is that she's used a neural ratio estimator to, to basically get the posterior over the value of H0 over uh, different individual observations that either have double images or quad images for the lens quasar. And then, uh, so on an individual lens basis, it's not very interesting because we have such large error bars. So the idea here is really that we want to get uh, inference that's accurate enough that we can do population that like we can combine basically uh, the different measurements in an unbiased way. So what she's shown is that she gets like good enough uh, uh, coverage probabilities to be able to do population level inference of H0. And she showed that even combining 8,000 measurements, you get an unbiased estimate of H0 with sub percent precision, which is what you would need to be able to inform like meaningfully the, the H0 debate. Yeah. Uh, so one of the main advantages, so these were very simplistic simulations. This was really just like a proof of concept. But the main advantage is that the only thing that's required to make the problem more realistic is a better simulation pipeline. So we know that like with traditional ways of measuring edge knots from strong lensing, it's really prone to a lot of systematic effects, systematic effects. And so it's extremely, that are really, really difficult to model. Like for example, the mass degeneracy. But with this method, the main advantage is that in addition to scalability, uh, we can really take all of those effects into account as long as we can simulate them, which is really not that difficult to do. Uh, another application of uh, neural ratio estimators is uh, to estimate the um, uh, the temperature of dark matter from uh, observed strongly lensed images. So this is work that's been done by our postdoc, uh, Adam Coogan, who has shown that uh, you can do this inference uh, in this way. So uh, of course, this really to be good enough to apply to real data, it needs a much better simulation pipeline. But these are proof of concept that show that this is a very promising direction. So this method of estimating the stairs um, has a lot of pros, mainly that if you want to estimate a low dimensional posterior, you can marginalize over a very large number of nuisance parameters, which is really great. Uh, but then one of the main caveats, in my opinion, is that because we have marginalized over those parameters, we've lost the ability to obtain simulations that are consistent with our observation. So we've really lost the ability to interrogate the black box. Um, so for example, if I say that my machine learning model tells me that the temperature of dark matter is 3 keV, um, I would really like to be able to understand where does that signal come from? Does it come from like one, like a 
few large subhalos in the galaxies, or does it come from a really large population of low mass subhalos? And I cannot do this with this model. I just have to take the answer at face value. So uh, in order to really address this, um, it really looks like what we're gonna have to do is really uh, to learn to do the inference at the level of the dark matter maps themselves. And this is going to require us to solve the problem of high dimensional inference, uh, which is a problem that was completely unsolved a couple of years ago, not just in astrophysics, but like in all sciences. So um, if we go back to uh, what made the source reference session work better with the RM, uh, which is the other example of high dimensional inference that we had that kind of worked well, even though we didn't have like access to uncertainties. Um, it really was the ability to learn implicitly a more complex prior that made it more powerful. So what we thought, and that's inspired by work from François Lanus and Niall Jeffrey, that um, we can use machine learning to learn this prior basically explicitly. So here, um, my prior should be like, what is the distribution of galaxy images in this super high dimensional space of like pixels? And then for this to be useful to us, we need to be able to learn uh, to be able to sample from this distribution. So like, and then so to learn distribution just from samples and then to be able to sample from it. So one way we could try to do this is to train a model to give the density of that distribution in this high dimensional space. Uh, yeah, so let's say that this is my training data. There's just a bunch of samples in this really high dimensional space. Uh, then I can try to learn, so these are like a bunch of galaxy images. So I can try to learn model the a model that gives me the density of that distribution from those samples. So in order to do that, I roughly would have an idea of how to do that. What I want to do is basically maximize uh, the likelihood of my data or like those samples by say like, like minimizing the KL divergence between like the two. So maximizing the likelihood. So uh, the problem is that learning this density is really hard, particularly in really high dimensions because I need to learn the normalization, con the normalization constant of the distribution, which is has some global information over like the whole space. So instead of doing that, uh, it turns out that uh, using a sampling method that's called longevity sampling, the only thing that I need to be able to uh, have to be able to sample my distribution and produce new samples is the score of this distribution. So that's the gradient of the log of the distribution with respect to the parameters. So here, like these are the, basically the pixels of the image. So the magic here is that because the normalizing constant is just a constant, when I take it gradient, it's going to vanish. So uh, basically, what I want to do is again start from my training data. Um, that are like galaxy images. And then I want to use those to learn, uh, so not the density, but the score function basically, which is a vector field uh, in that space. Uh, so because this vector field doesn't have like that normalized constant, it only has local information in that space. So it's like much easier to learn. Um, so if I can find a way to learn the scores from the sample, uh, then from the samples, and I can use longer sampling to generate new samples from those learned scores. So I don't have time to get into like the specific details of this, um, but the way that we can learn those scores is with something called denoising uh, score matching or like the score matching. So once we've learned them, if we want to generate samples from that prior using a lot of sampling, what we do is that we sample Gaussian noise and then we denoise it with a reverse time stochastic differential equation in SDE. And then what we end up with is a sample from our distribution. So in our case, it's the image of a realistic galaxy. So uh, Connor Stone, who's a postdoc in our group, has done some work like creating a data set to train such a denoising score-based model. And then, so we can use it to generate as many new galaxies as we want. So here, some of those galaxies are real galaxies and some are not, and I would have no idea which one is which. So you can go to this website to generate things that are not galaxies, but that really look like galaxies. It's kind of a fun uh, game to play. Um, all right. But then like really what you want to do is not to just produce samples from the prior, what you want to do is produce samples from the posterior. Um, so as before, the only thing that we would need is the score of the distribution we want to sample. So that's the score of the posterior. And then using base scan, this is equal to the score of the likelihood plus the score of the prior, which we have already modeled with our, uh, with our score based model. So the cool thing is that because I know the physical model, and say I can identify this Gaussian, I also know the likelihood. Uh, and so it's score analytically, uh, modulo like a small approximation. So with this, um, I can basically use the same denoising method to produce posterior samples. 
So these are um, these are some examples um, of these posterior samples as a function of the amount of noise that I have uh, in my data. So the ground truth here is on the left uh, with the observation that's like not noise on the left. And then uh, the bottom row is the noisy observation. So we can see that as when there's very little noise in the observation, I get posterior samples that are really coherent uh, among each other. So there's very little variability in my posterior samples because my likelihood is extremely constrained. There's a lot of information on likelihood. But then as I increase the amount of noise in my data, I have less and less like constrained information in my likelihood. And then what happens in lensing is that the central part of the background galaxy is highly magnified. So there's a lot more information about the central part of the background galaxy rather than the outskirts of the galaxy. So we see that as we increase the amount of noise, the central part of the background galaxy still gets reconstructed pretty constructed. So it, um, like consistently across different samples, but then the outskirts of the background galaxy gets filled by information that comes from the prior, up until the point where we have basically just noise in the observation and we just get random samples from the prior uh, on the right. And then if we were to average all of those, it would be just noise as if there was no background source. So then we can do the same game of looking at how well this does for out of distribution examples. And so this is an example where instead of a galaxy as a background source, I use a number seven that's been generated by Dali to make this mock observation. And then once again, you see that for an observation where there's very little noise, I have uh, I have basically, uh, the, the even though it's really outside of my distribution, there's so much information in my likelihood that I managed to really reconstruct very well the seven as the background source. But then as I increase the amount of noise in my observation, there's less and less information about the outskirts. So that information gets filled in by the prior, but still the central part of the seven is reconstructed consistently because there's more observation about that in, in the likelihood in the observation, up until the point where I have just a reconstruction of noise and then it's just a random sample from the prior that I get as my reconstruction. And there's no like consistent information across my, my, my posterior samples. Um, all right. Okay, so uh, then the question is like, okay, great, I'm managing to get samples, but how do I know that these are samples from my posterior and they're just samples from some other distribution that is not the distribution that I want? So that's like the question of accuracy. So to test that, typically what's done is called like a coverage test. So it's a bit of a frequent test in the sense that like we look at the fraction of time, the fraction of time that like the ground truth falls within an interval over like multiple experiments. And, and ideally you'd like that fraction of time to be equal to like the confidence level of that interval. So um, uh, it's typical for those sets to look at like the highest density region, like what is drawn here, uh, because that's easier to understand conceptually, I guess. But then uh, in high dimension, it's really hard to think about how you're going to find the highest density region in your posterior by generating samples. So um, that's one problem is that it doesn't scale really well to extremely high dimensional spaces. And then the other thing is that even if you pass this coverage test, you could still be biased because passing the test is a necessary condition for being well calibrated, but it's not a sufficient one. So what we've done with my postdoc uh, Pablo uh, is to design a new kind of coverage test where instead of looking at the highest density regions, we look at random density regions that are are generated from one example, and every time it's a different random region. And so doing this only requires defining a distance between the points instead of evaluating the density, which is super easy even in high dimension. And then on top of that, we've shown that passing this test is, an is a necessary and sufficient condition for calibration. So there's a pip installable uh, Python package uh, called tarp that does that. So I should have put the link here, but uh, I, I didn't, but it's on the CLA uh, GitHub. Oh, so uh, about uh, 10 minutes left. OK, perfect. I'm almost done, actually. Um, so yeah, so we can apply this to the posterior samples of galaxies that I showed before. And then we get that we are, like our posterior samples are very well calibrated. So this is super encouraging. So one last thing that I want to end with um, is that like this is looking super promising to apply this to data and then like get groundbreaking or new results by measuring the temperature of dark matter. But one of the main difficulty that remains is that like everything that we discussed so far was assuming Gaussian noise and that you could write down our noise model in closed form. Uh, but then in reality, things are never Gaussian. Uh, the noise is almost never perfectly Gaussian. And assuming that this Gaussian can definitely bias the inference. 
So just to show an example of this, here I'm showing a real noise from HST, the Hubble Space Telescope, and GWST, the James Webb Telescope, uh, on, on, on the right. So clearly this is, there's a lot of correlated noise in there and it's very, very non-Gaussian. So uh, what can we do uh, in this case? So the first thing we can do is that we can learn the score model to learn the score of this additive noise component. So uh, basically, if I do that, if I just like use empty patches of noise, I can learn a score model to know what is the distribution of that noise. And then we can use that to generate new noise samples, like the one that I'm showing at the bottom. These were generated using a score-based model. And then that would be a really good way to get more realistic noise that I could include, say, in a simulation-based inference framework. But then I could also, uh, yeah, so that's the noise model that I learned with my score-based model. But then I could also do this. Uh, I could also use this to do inference with long-term sampling as before. So to do that, basically, so this is the score model that I learned. Um, to do that, I can realize that if, to write on like I can write down the likelihood of the data given the model in terms of uh, the noise likelihood, basically. And so using that now, uh, I can do long-term sampling of the likelihood to infer the parameters of interest. So the only issue is that the score here is with respect to the parameters data, um, not uh, the one that our score model learned, which was with respect to X. Uh, so in order uh, to do that, the only thing that I need to do is to use a train rule uh, and then use the fact that I have a differentiable physical model to evaluate the Jacobian. And then I can rewrite this in terms of, of everything that I can evaluate basically. So um, I can use this to do like parameter inference. So this is a real realization of noise that comes from uh, GWST. And then we've injected some strong lensing, uh, strong lens source and we try to infer the distribution of like the lensing parameters that are in this simulation. But the noise is real noise. So if I had assumed that my noise was Gaussian, I would have gotten a very biased inference in blue. But then using the um, this like uh, score-based model as my likelihood, then I can get an unbiased inference of the gray contours. So um, this is uh, yeah, and this is the coverage test basically for uh, for doing inference like that over many realizations. So this is looking really promising to actually allow us to analyze real data with like HST and GWC, but also like in the very near future LSST and Euclid with uh, those methods. So I just want to end by uh, hoping that I've convinced you that in the coming years with like 170,000 lenses coming with LSSC and Euclid, we're going to be in a really good position to make fascinating discoveries about our universe powered by machine learning. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lawrence, for an excellent talk.